welcome back to Pastor Plex Podcast. I am Pastor Plex, and we're recording live. Actually, we're, we are straight up live uh, all across the nation right now, and I'm so glad to be doing this live in Austin, Texas, with none other than Katie Sass, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, Katie. Hi, happy to be here. Yeah, you know, Katie, this is like um, kind of our thing now. We're, we're kind of like... Are we professionals? We're professionals. Wow. Yeah. We've arrived. So uh, we are uh, going to be talking faith, culture, and everything in between. And we're going to start off with what I talked about on Sunday on Pastor Plex, well, I guess that's at Wells Branch Community Church. And we're going to bring that to Pastor Plex Podcast. And what we really talked about was what it is to have a glad and generous heart. And there's a couple things that prevent it. One is our own pride. We don't look at other people like family, and we really don't have a hope in Jesus. And um, we looked at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, which I know when when you say like 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, that, that I don't know if that kind of is like one of those awe-gripping moments of like, oh, I know what's in that. Uh, most people don't. It's essentially Paul defending his apostleship after getting kicked out of Thessalonica for causing a riot because he brought the gospel. And then uh, he reminds the uh, Thessalonian church how much he loved them like a nursing mother on one end, which is sort of weird to think about, and then as a father exhorting and raising up his children. And then the the whole thing is he was excited about presenting uh, this church to Jesus because of how awesome that they were. And so that's kind of where we went uh, this past Sunday. Katie, I don't know if there's anything that stuck out to you about this particular sermon uh, for you. So first, you didn't list all three. You just said pride. What are the other two? Pride, we don't look at other people like family, and we don't have a hope in Jesus. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) I was listening, I swear. No, no, yeah. Um, No, actually a story came to mind. Yeah, yeah, hit me. It's a very uh, embarrassing story. Oh, uh, that's the best Um, kind. Leah Brown is going to be so excited that I'm (laughs) telling this story. (laughs) We need to get Leah back here. All right, go with we the story. We do. We really do. She's great. Um, so probably about six years ago, um, <laughs> I there was this like, do you remember about six or seven years ago where the discipleship women's Leah, Katie, yeah, yeah, patterns. and yeah, it was it was the discipleship program kind of started, and there was this group that Leah had put together were you, at her were you house. Part of, like the elite. Group? I was not invited. Oh, so I'm getting to that part. So I remember Katie was like telling me about it. This, I mean, this was like, so I was still pretty baby Christian. And, but I thought I kind of like, you know how early on I would put people on levels. <laughs> and so Wait, like. Hold on. You need to explain what you mean by levels because that's very important. Like, like a matureness level or like right, right. capability levels of like, okay, well. You're, you're a two. You are a five. Yeah, you like, are an eight. Uh, I'm a little better than you. <laughs> like, and I I just like didn't have a good grasp of grace and right. and like what actual maturity, mm-hmm. what matur- maturity is not putting people on maturity levels. Okay, good. So <clears throat> I find out about this, this like meeting, right? And I'm thinking, oh yeah, of course it's girls that I consider better than me. <laughs> well then, like that wasn't what like made me feel like unloved or whatever. Right. It was when I found out who else was there, and I found out there are other girls there that I considered myself better than. Oh. And and I became so offended. Yeah. And, I mean, I was like, still— Like, when you say how, because this is where I, I, I love to get into this, because I feel like I encounter offended people a lot, and it's usually because of something I've done. But talk to me about the offense and how you feel on the inside and all that, because it, it, it would help me just as a pastor. Well, it's rooted in insecurity. Okay. It's rooted in, well, it's rooted in pride, which a lot of times pride can show up as an insecurity. Right. So, like, if you're really prideful, it's really because you're really insecure. Right. No, that's fair. And so... And that's why I talked about, like, either your pride is like, look at me, look, I'm awesome, or like, don't look at me, stop, everyone stop looking at me. Yeah, and and it's like, literally no one's looking at you. (laughs) Like, no one cares. So... (laughs) Once I started reminding myself of that, no one's no one cares right. about like, like no one's looking at you. Right. So I find out about this meeting that Leah Brown had put together, and I was like, "What the heck?" Like I I disciple girls. Like it was a, a meeting of other girls that were discipling other girls, right. and I'm like, "Are you kidding?" Like, 
why would I not be invited? But you're kind of awesome. Like, what do they just think I'm incapable? Like, what they I'm incompetent to them? And I just go down the list of like why why Leah sucks and <laughs> like I, and so then, but you know because I was <laughs> because I was so mature, right? Instead of talking to her about how I felt immediately, I just wrote about it. Oh. Oh, yeah. I love, did you put that on social media? I did. Oh, I, that's, so good. that's good. I made a very, I pulled a Taylor Swift. That's good. So I just wrote this really passive aggressive post. Yeah. About why you shouldn't care if someone thinks that you're like not good enough or whatever but, it is. And it, it's like the, I was trying to make it sound like really encouraging. Yeah. But the root of it was. I'm mad because I wasn't included. So, so did did anyone know that it was like? Was oh, it, Leah was, immediately knew. <laughs> she immediately knew that it was about her, and so I think that next week I ended up getting invited to the thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, so moral of the story: if you want to get invited, you put yeah. a passive aggressive comment and just, guarantee it's an invite. Just write about it and <laughs> <laughs> tell everybody but the person so that they see it in passing. Just really complain about it for yeah. a while, and you'll eventually get invited. So then we ended up talking about it, but it's it was hilarious because like just recently it got brought brought back up again and we laughed about it and it was really funny. And so now I look back, I'm like, why why did I care so much about being included into this like what I perceived as like the it crowd, you right. know, like it, like we're in high school again. Yeah, oh, uh, like like listen, oh my there gosh, is no there difference are... between high school and church oh, except we yeah. have way better uh, ways. Except to we just read it. the Bible. Yeah. Like, no, you can put Bible verses out there yeah. that kind of like cloak your insecurity and you just kind of beat people over the head with that. Yeah. Well, and now I'm mortified. I'm absolutely mortified <laughs> of of like just what I did. And you could probably still scroll way, 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 way back in oh. my social media posts yeah, we and should find probably it. Bring that up and repost and it. It was it was And then right, this is for you, Leah Brown. <laughs> I'm going to send this podcast to Leah. To like, remember? <laughs> and, I mean, now, I mean, obviously we love each other. And yeah. it, like, we loved each other then, too. But I was, like, had this moment of, like, well, I, think, I, I didn't feel accepted by the cool girls. And so I'm just going to be offended and walk around and complain about it. Okay, so I think this is what you're unmasking or unmasking. Or you are revealing what I feel is, like, goes on at churches all the time. All the time. All the time. Uh, because we're human, right? And so... <clears throat> you know, in my, my, my son is in fourth grade. And so there is like a hierarchy of cool that goes into fourth grade. And my other son, Jet, he's in second grade. And my other son's in kindergarten. There's always a hierarchy of cool in, you know, on the playground and mm -hmm. everybody wants to be accepted. And I, I, and I feel like God is probably looking at us uh, in th sort of the same way I talk to my sons. Like it doesn't matter the, like, why are you trying to impress that other person that's mm -hmm. trying to impress another person? You yeah. guys are all insecure. And I think that's the point where we are so consumed with ourselves and we're worried about what everyone's thinking about us. And kind of like to the point you're bringing up yeah. is, is that if you think you're awesome, you're like, everyone should see how awesome I am. But then if you're also like, how come everyone must think I suck? Everyone must think I'm Oh awful, my gosh. Right? And that is the worst place to be because you're so self-centered. Yes. Right. So yeah. I, Okay, beautiful. So I think and that's where I, we were getting uh, to this place where Paul gave away his significance in the ministry that he had to the Thess Thessalonians. He thought so much of them. Uh, he was not wanting to charge them for his apostleship. Even after they became believers, he wasn't like, oh, well, that'll be forty nine ninety nine. You can put your uh, deposit in my, you just Venmo me. It's fine. Like he didn't do that. What he did was he served, he he worshiped alongside them, and he trained them uh, in two ways. And I thought this was really unique. Uh, as a nursing mom and as a, uh, like a, a father who is teaching the way. And I, did, did, you, was that, did that strike you as weird that a man would call himself a nursing mom and then also a father in like two sentences apart? Um, maybe because I think nursing is really beautiful. I, <laughs> I, wouldn't, I don't think that's weird. I thought that was very endearing. Okay. Yeah, I just think that's weird in general. <clears throat> I think because you've never nursed a baby before. I, I have never nursed a baby. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I don't even think it's biologically possible. And I know I might it's be not. behind the times on that. but It's definitely not. Okay. So so I, what I appreciated about that, and, and immediately after that, I was, I was uh, you know, after service, you have a conversation with people. And, and a guy was asking me, hey, how do I handle this situation? I got a believer that is acting immature. Do I kind of come at him? 
you know, hard, like suck it up, man up, or do I come at them with like, oh man, I get that, it's really hard. And I say, oh man, this is actually, a, there are times when you need to be the nursing mother and nurture someone like, as they're going through difficulty mm-hmm. and they, they're taking on challenge and there's a kind of this part of depression. Because if you come at them hardcore, uh, like, hey, suck it up, man, and then they just go, they go into the pit of despair. Right. And so there's, there's a, you're, you're a lot always, like parenting, huh? It is exactly like parenting, and it, especially parenting four boys, because you don't want to crush kids' emotions, but we don't want to grow, raise whiners. And so, yeah. so I felt like uh, with him, I was like, right now you need to be a nursing mom, uh, where you're gonna say to this this young man, listen, uh, God loves you, and those feelings you have are genuine and real. Uh, and come, Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my uh, yoke is easy, my burden is light. At that. Matthew eleven twenty eight is always juxtaposed. I think that's the nursing mom, Jesus. And then you've got, um, you know, father that's exhorting others to walk in the way of the Lord. That's, if anyone would come after me, uh, you must take up your cross daily and follow me. And I think that's, you're always sort of trying to figure out the right place there, especially in Austin, especially when people are sensitive and they have church hurt, which just means probably somebody told them the truth and they didn't like to hear it. And maybe it was they told them the truth when they needed to be nursed and, and as a mother would nurse them and not as a father would command them to kind of walk in the way of the Lord. I, I, and this is where people are just doing the best they can. And I think what Paul had a unique skill set was he was able to be a nursing mom and then uh, skillful in his way to commend and command men to, to lead their families, to walk as Christ called them to walk. Um, but how have and, and this is the part I would love your insight on, Katie. How have you seen that? Just you know, because your experience as Wells Branch Community Church is kind of like it uh, as far as church goes. I mean, it's been like 10 years. Yeah, it's been like 10 years. And so uh, how have you seen like uh, nursing mom type moments and then a father exhorting you to walk in the way of the Lord? How, is, how have you experienced that? Oh, personally. Yeah, yeah. This is like a, a personal question. And this is like when did Leah ever like, oh, I'm so sorry you feel so sad. And then she's like, hey, suck it up, buttercup. We got to, you know. Oh no, she didn't say that. Okay, well, what oh, she yeah. say? She was really sweet. She was like, "Oh, so, I'm so sorry. I like, I kind of suck at this." Or she, I don't know. She but, owned like, whatever she, part she. Could. Oh, she owned it, and she was like, "But she didn't. It wasn't like, oh, I should have invited you. Oh, yeah, I made a wrong choice. It was, I'm sorry I made you feel that way. Right. Like I'm sorry you felt that way. So, do you ever feel that's condescending, or do you feel like how appropriate that was? Or like was like, oh, it was man, really appropriate. Yeah. yeah, yeah, because I needed that. I didn't need. I didn't need her to validate my insecurity. Mm. I needed her to understand my feelings. Good. Because there's a, there's a difference <clears throat> yeah. in validating someone's insecurity and mm. enabling them to right. live in that insecurity, but and then validating their emotions. Right, and I think that's key. There's a difference there. Yeah. Uh, we're validating uh, emotion. Like, it is true that you feel awful. Oh, man, I am so sorry you feel awful without going... Um, oh, you're right. You, we should cater our whole lives to your insecurity. Right, right. Oh, that's good. I'm not going to, like, turn back time and change my decision. Right. It it was just like, it was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't, didn't know you were going to feel that way. So, but I have had times, so, like, there are several, several, several occasions where people were very understanding of my feelings Mm -hmm. um and then there have been times where i've been called out you know like a a father would call out his sons um where i actually talked about this at a a few years ago at um gosh what was it the shepherd's retreat oh yeah where i was in a i had just become a christian it was probably like a year a year after becoming a christian and i was invited into this discipleship group and i didn't know that discipleship groups were like very serious (laughs) And um, there was one day where I decided, I was like, oh, I need to take a nap. It was after church. I'm going to take a nap. And I woke up, and I felt really groggy. And I was like, oh, I think I'm just going to not go to group. (laughs) And so I text Katie. Katie Foster was the one that was leading this group. And I was like, hey, I just woke up from a nap, and I feel super out of it. I think I'm going to stay home tonight. And I just thought, that's a valid excuse. Yeah, you know, tired, sleepy. And so – and we had known, like, it wasn't like I just met her. We had known each other long enough for her to have this. Because you have to have relational capital with right. someone before you can just call them out. Right. And so she goes, Katie, if you're not going to take this seriously, then you shouldn't be in it. Right. Like, she's like, this is, 
I like I'm investing my time in this group and like I feel like if you're gonna miss group because you took a nap <laughs> then like she's like I, it's okay I'm not gonna be offended if you don't want to come but I do want you to like take it seriously right and I was like oh so you kind of need that you wake do, up call. you need that and I think that's I think what's happened in church culture if, if we're honest we have uh, swung, and maybe this is, I don't know, if, maybe you could speak into this. I feel like we've swung as a church culture, I don't know at our church necessarily, but maybe in our church, swung more towards a nursing mom because we don't offend anybody, uh, as opposed to being the overly, you know. As in treating everyone as their infants. Right. We don't want to hurt their, hurt their feelings, make start, them feel uncomfortable. Right. But un- discomfort is what promotes change. Growth and change. And so I feel like that's what get, you have to have both. There's like, oh, I can validate your feelings, but then challenge. It's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay that way. I think that's right. probably the, the best way to put that. Okay. Well, and if you're uncomfortable, then maybe there's a sin issue that you're struggling with. Right. And I think, and again, usually that's where we don't like to talk about that. Yeah. Um, and, and in fact, in, in in we're so afraid of seeming holier than thou that we don't want to talk to other people about their sin. Right. Oh, that's good. Well, and this is one of the questions <laughs> that was brought up. Said you said that sleeping with your girlfriend is darkness and homosexuality. Why are those things darkness? Uh, that is, and, and I did mention that. And I, I said there is reality of like I think there's a place where um, if you're struggling with homosexuality, if if uh, same-sex attraction is, is something that you're dealing with, and we have a lot of that at our church, and I'm so glad that those people are at our church. Uh, it's a matter of, though, like validating the feeling that you, you're experiencing something difficult. Mm-hmm. But there, what happens, I think, with progressive Christianity, they, they, they take it a step too far, and they say something along the lines of, well, that's the way God made you. Or that is just who you, your identity is based in your sexual identity that you've chosen for yourself or you feel. Mm-hmm. And, and this is the part where, you know, I get asked a lot, um, are people born that way? And I'm like, oh, man, you know, we haven't found the gay gene yet. But even, <laughs> if, a per- even if a person was, uh, even if a person was born gay, uh, there's people born blind. There's people born with sickness and disease and you don't just go like, well, they need to just really affirm. We, we want to bring healing to that disease. We want to bring healing. We want to bring correction to whatever that, you know, I was born wanting to have, you know, sex with multiple women. And so now that I'm married, I, I have to go, oh, wait, I feel that way. But now I'm married to one woman. And so therefore, I can't act out on the urges that I feel. Mm -hmm. And so at some point, and this goes, this is what, how a father was run. At some point you have to grow up and Mm -hmm. not be a slave to your feelings. Now it's a, it's, you have every, you can feel however you feel, but then self-control, this is a fruit of the spirit. Self-control, that fruit of the spirit comes from abiding in God's word, abiding in, in who Jesus is. And so therefore, when we talk about those things, um, we really got to exhort people to walk in the way of the Lord, not in the way of their feelings. What do you, anything you want to add to that? Because I think we were talking about this earlier when we, we talked about this question. And you're like, what, what can you even say to that? Oh, yeah. I mean, to me, it's a very obvious answer. Well, because it's sin. But then you have to go a lot deeper into explaining why it's sin. And yeah. but Well, because, I mean, this is one of the things I'm, I'm actually writing a book about uh, sex, singleness, and serious relationships. And one of the things I'm trying to get in there is God has a design for sex. Yes. And it's not just, um, you know, a draconian way of stifling people so that they can procreate yeah. uh, and make it as efficient as possible. Like, Jesus isn't trying to be a fun sucker. Right. But it's it's kind of like the, the fire analogy. Mm-hmm. I, I just, I this brings me back to the egg analogy and how you just completely ruined <laughs> the egg analogy for me. And so you might that. ruin the fire. I'm not going to ruin the fire me. one. I think okay. the, the fire one's actually in the Bible. Do you, do you, oh, well, it's kind of like a fire in the fireplace is where it belongs. Yes. Like and a fire. Nice warm. Yes. A fire where it is supposed to be is beautiful. Mm-hmm. But a fire in the middle of the living room floor, well, that's a little destructive. That's a little destructive. And what people would say, I think, is, 
it's okay if somebody wants to move the fire pit to the middle of the living room floor. Who are you to say it's not? And then you okay, like, well then watch how it explodes your life. It, it, exactly, and they say, "Well, I can deal with that explosion." And I think this is what happens with people just, that are let's just justify down our terrible path, decisions. Right? Uh, and th- we live in a world right now, and we were talking about this earlier. As we and this it spawned us looking up drag queen shows in libraries. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you're like Terrifying. public libraries with children. There's a drag queen show of drag queens. Now they're not dressed up in bikinis, although there's they're in like like princess outfits, princess outfits. And- like, nothing about it was, like, immodest. Too much. But it was, yeah. it was just, it was a, a man dressed as a woman appropriating gender dysphoria. Yeah, and saying, kind of going like, hey, if you, whatever you are, you can be that. And what ends up happening is, like, you know, the American Society of Pediatrics uh, has recently come out with a thing where they are telling pediatri- pediatricians uh, to start puberty blockers as soon as possible. And what, what the big pushback that recently came out with a lot of doctors kind of pushing back about against the society was counseling should be involved way before that. Uh, the first thing, we're not going to go with drugs to be the first thing uh, that a child needs because, you know, when we say that kid wants to be an astronaut, we're like, oh, that's sweet. And we don't, you know, we're like, oh, that's, or a kid wants to be a fire truck. We don't go, well, it's time to go take them to the auto shop and get some, you know, fitted for wheels. You know, we don't, we don't yeah. do that. And so when a, when a boy says he wants to be a princess when he grows up, we don't go, oh, well, that makes sense. Let's start the puberty blockers now that you're seven. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the struggle that we're finding as a culture. And, and I think, and if we're honest, I, I think there was a real push to stop bullying a long time ago. And now it's become reverse bullying where you get bullied for not, you know, embracing a um, gender fluid uh, reality. Mm-hmm. And, and this is where, this is, this is the struggle. Um, and something, you know, I have kids in public school, and so I have to train them very clearly about what's okay, what's not okay, um, how Christians are to act, how Christians are not how to, how to act. Uh, And that's hard. That is a very difficult thing to do, um, to speak into. But if God has a design and we get, and the question gets, why are those things darkness? Well, if God has a design and he wants to bring all things to the light, then what what happens is when you take someone and and you go, you know, hey, sleeping with my girlfriend, "Eh, that's okay. I mean, Jesus and I have a deal. Or listen, you know, love is love. And if I can, as a man, love another man, why are we, you know, thumbs down on that? And it's not just that we're thumbs down. It's just that's not promoting what God has designed, what God has blessed, and what God is seeking. And that's why one of the things that Jesus said, you know, out of the heart, out of the heart comes all sorts of evil, evil thoughts. And the next thing he says is sexual morality. And where is he defining, getting that definition of sexual immorality from? There is no other definition of sexual immorality other than from Leviticus and from the Old Testament, which in other places where Jesus wants to sort of fulfill that in his personhood with, of the ceremonial laws, such as kosher eating laws, he, he clearly like smashes that and has no problem with it. But with sexual morality, that's something that is, comes from evil because it's rewriting what God determined good uh, in morally for people uh, as opposed to ceremonially for like things that you would eat. That That's what made you um, unclean. Does that make sense? Yeah, and everyone loves Leviticus. Yeah, well, you, know? <laughs> you know, it is kind of fascinating. I know that maybe, maybe this is the part where I'm a nerd and I, I like reading that stuff, um, but I have my quiet times Leviticus about, uh, I've been going a chapter a day now for... Well, if you're a Christian, then you appreciate Leviticus. Yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah, yeah. But so, it, if you're not a Christian, then you're like, oh, this is why Christians are bigots. Right. And you look at that like, oh, my gosh, that's an abomination to the Lord. I mean, how yeah. can you say that? And what does that even mean? So hateful. Yeah, that's hateful. And, you know, clearly you don't love people. Okay. Right. All right. So. Um, it makes me think of when you said last week yeah. about discipline. Yeah. Like, I love you too much to let you disobey. Right. And so whenever we love someone deeply and they are believers, because if they're not believers, it's different. Mm -hmm. But if they are believers saying, hey, I love you too much to let you live in this manner. Right. And I think that's love. That is um, nurturing like mothers is like, you know, validating feeling. And then loving as a father is commanding you to say, 
Yeah. I love you too much to let you disobey. I love that. Yeah, that's great. Purity, <clears throat> purity is freaking hard. So yeah, it's like we get it. Everybody, every Christian that's ever been engaged or dating struggled. Yeah. I, I got another question, which I'm not really sure how to best bring this question into this because it's a pretty long one. But let me... Did you, I know you read this question, and so what do you think? <laughs> you Why did you just say I read it? Well, you did read it, right? I, you said it's like a blog, and I'm like, okay, yeah. Let's, I didn't read it because it looked like a blog. Okay, let me just see if I can summarize. Uh, to add on the man's side of the sermon, excuses are not masculine. When we make excuses, we negate responsibility. This is unattractive. It makes us as men untrustworthy. Our excuses are holding us back from intimacy and connection to be seen and to witness. It, uh, okay, no one resonates with a man who doesn't take responsibility and ownership of his actions or his past. Is that true? No one resonates with a man who doesn't take responsibility and ownership of his actions or his past. Yeah, I, I could. Like, you're not going like resonates like. Re- like I don't think to? Re- maybe respects. I do think a lot of people do that. So well, I because think- I think that's. A lot of men would relate to that. Yeah, I think a lot of men do relate to that. But it's not respectable. Right, not respectable. I think that's probably what this person means. So many of us as men are so fearful to own our mistakes, the pain we've caused others, and shame, and even our dreams. We're fearful because we carry deep embarrassment about who we are or who we have been. Maybe they were shamed as a young child. Yeah, and I, and I think that there is a lot of truth. If This is one of the things I was trying to bring up uh, on Sunday, and maybe you can help me unpack this a little bit better because I tried to say and I realized ooh I'm not unpacking this very well <clears throat> but if you've had a poor family upbringing meaning, meaning you didn't see a father loving but correcting a mother nurturing and submitting and you, you didn't have any you yeah. didn't have a traditional family upbringing where you saw healthy relate you didn't see conflict right. worked out you, okay so let's say you had a a mom that was overly controlling. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so what happens in marriage is now, if a, a woman like gets frustrated in the marriage and she like says something you know mean or disrespectful, what can happen for that man? He doesn't go, oh, that's a one-off. That's just who she is. And I got to stop it. So the man then comes down draconian style. You will not talk to me like that. And now we've got like, now, now, oh, and then she's triggered because she had an overbearing dad. She's like, I promised myself I would never have that overbearing dad. And so she's like, she's going to put an end to that. And she's like, oh, yeah? Oh, we're going we're gonna to go toe-to-toe. And so all of a sudden you have a battle royal, uh, Fortnite style, of everyone you know, breaking out the weapons of, at their disposal of cheap shots and satire and, and conversation. And so all of a sudden we're, we're now arguing about the argument because of the way it was presented and because it triggered something from our past. And I think that's when you only have a negative example of family, your natural reaction is to be triggered by just about everything your spouse does that isn't perfect. And I don't, can you, have you noticed that, seen that? Can you speak, can you validate that or am I just off my, off a rail here? Well, I think I'm just trying to swallow everything that you said. Well, it's kind of like this. So, so let's just walk through your. You yeah, we can it. use my. Yeah. Marriage. So tell me about your family growing up. Well, uh, oh. I would, whenever, whenever you mentioned, like, submitting, like, seeing my mom submit, yeah. um, I, I think my mom almost submitted so much to a point where she lost herself. Right. To where that, then, when she is like, I want to feel like myself, I want to have fun, I want to, you know, live my life, that's when the affair happened. And because my dad was so controlling, he was so busy just not paying attention to her, but hoping she would do what he wanted her to do. Okay. So, <clears throat> all right, that's a good example. So, so like he didn't invest in like the relationship. <laughs> I guess I felt okay, kind how about, of so if, so if, if Ryan ever said, hey, we need to stop spending money in this area. Would that sort of resort to, oh, I don't want you to be like my dad? There could be a, a, a tendency to kind of go there. No, because I think I've seen where that's. Maybe early on. Because I think, because you've been married, now how long have you guys married? Uh, six and a half years. Yeah, so you're, you're kind of beyond some of that. But early on, was there any resistance towards like any sort of leadership that Ryan would, would, would give to you? 
Or no, you're like no, because wow. I think I like I was so afraid. I had I had so many. Well, I still do, but I had so many issues when we first got married that I was so afraid of being left. To where I just oh okay did. so I was like super submissive, like tried to not have a strong opinion about okay. things that he wanted to well, do. Well, that sort of changed. Uh, <laughs> that did change. So, but so let's go to that. You were the super submissive. Why? Out of fear, which was what? The fear of being left. And where did you see that in your family? Uh, my dad. Yeah. So, so okay. So you kind of took on the, the same sort of, so the triggering thing for you wasn't a reaction against Ryan. It was like something to do for yourself so that I don't lose him. Cause clearly he doesn't really want to be with me. Yeah. But in what's funny is I, I would, I was so afraid of being left because my, I, I've, I've always felt like my dad left, like yeah. my dad let our family right. fall apart because right. dads dads are the the ones that save their families dads right. are the ones that protect their families keep their families safe um and so when i kind of i kind of saw him not really be the dad that i needed him to be mm -hmm. um and but then i when i was in fight or flight mode whenever we'd get into fights i resorted to my mom right. when my mom would leave the house right. and so i'm like there was one day Ryan was had me like guarding the door because he's like, "Stop trying to leave." Like I was like, "I'm no, I can't be here. I'm leaving." Like she would just leave and park on the end of the road. <laughs> and so yeah, so I, I so that's to the point. So there's within us there's like you know I don't want to get into over psychological babble, but I I do want to point out that the way that you were raised has a lot to do the way yes. you interact. And so if you've all you've seen is negative interaction, you don't know what healthy looks like. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you res what, what might be a behavioral bad decision by a husband or a wife becomes like a character assassination. And you yes. want to run away or fight him or like, I'm going to put an end to this as opposed yeah. to go, hey, that, that really hurt me. Like when you said that, that hurt me. Like that's yeah. what a normal person would do. Uh, but uh, if you've been hurt a lot, then you go post about it on Facebook and about <laughs> <laughs> hey, we all grow. Okay? Right, right. No, no, but yeah. I, I guess that's my point. It's like Ryan and I had to really dissect all these issues. Did you ever have like a, a fight with your husband via social media? Like, just in case you were wondering how, you know, like one of those after a fight. No, no you were. No, you at least kind of had that. Your baseline was don't post my fights on social media. Oh, I posted all of our fights on social media. <laughs> I, that was like, Therapeutic. How I, that was how I processed it. Okay, no, that's fair. All right, that's fair. And Ryan was okay. I think it helped his pride a little bit. Yeah. To well, like have a wife that just, oh, let me tell you everyone about our fight and what, what I learned from it. But. He's great. Yeah, we had to, I mean, because of course he, everyone has childhood baggage. Everyone right. has stuff they have to work through. And so we had to grow a lot in that. Cause <laughs> like, but he, it's his. Issue, your spouse's issues are going to be, you know, naturally so different from yours. And right. so you, you just work through them. Yeah. Okay. Well, I feel like that, that's kind of the piece here. That's why we need correction in our life because I think there, <clears throat> one, on one side, of it, there's a lot of nurturing that can happen. I think in churches mm -hmm. are great at that. We're great at comfort. We can kind of point to the hope in Jesus. But I think there is the real reality of, of what we need is some father figures in our lives. And if, and if I'm honest, there just aren't a lot of men um, who are older. You know, we need more gray hairs that mm -hmm. are willing to go, hey, I see the potential in you, and I love you enough to put the fire out. Yeah. Uh, and I think that there's a real call for that. So, Can you read that question? Like, yeah. There was something that really striked me. Struck you? St striked, <laughs> not struck? Striked is kind of struck. Struck. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, whatever. Oh, thanks. Public schools. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Sorry. Listen, well, I, I grew up in one, and I, I'm the same way. So right. he mentioned, I mean, I'm assuming this is a man. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Um, because he's in it, he said, us as men feel this way. Right. Um, but he talked about, like, experiencing shame in, like, what right was here. it, not wanting to. The pain we've caused. And our shame, uh, so many of us are so fearful of our own mistakes, the pain we've caused others, our shame, and even our dreams. We're fearful we carry deep embarrassment about who we are or who we have been. So many of us have grown up in abusive, absent, or repressive households, not knowing how to emote, how to express, have lost mm -hmm. our sense of self, and therefore have cultivated a gnawing frustration of life that is projected outwardly. 
having controlling or even en- enmeshed parents, we have diffused ourselves of our own responsibility. In other words, that's a lot of jargon for um, we have parents so involved in our lives, we don't feel responsibility for anything. Um, <clears throat> wanting others in some way to save us or take away our pain. And if not another, then pornography, sex, drugs, excessive achievement, wealth, status, and any addiction that validates us and distracts us from unaddressed pain. We, we haven't known how to help ourselves, and as a result, we have either, re, either retreated, we have, oh, we've either retreated from the world in compounded shame and meekness or lashed out in leaky aggression and blame with no connection to the actual healing that really needs to transpire. So two things come to mind. Mm-hmm. Hit me. Number one. Either he was extremely shamed as a kid. Anytime mm-hmm. he made a mistake, yeah. mistakes were not allowed. Right. Um, so then that has grown into marriage right. to where maybe maybe there are secrets he doesn't want to tell his wife. Maybe there are things that he's struggling with that he, it's like, okay, well, I'm going to cope with this with X, Y, and Z. Right. Or he was put on a pedestal right. as a kid to where he, he was perceived as perfect, such a good kid, such a, you know, so well-behaved, had all the things to where... He had this secret life of mistakes right. that he never wanted to share because he was on a pedestal. Right. And he could not disappoint well, anyone. And that's... So it's like... I mean, but that kind of makes me sad because in both situations, you feel like you are not enough, not accepted. So then when you get married, you are absolutely terrified to relive that. Right. And, and I think that goes into, I saw a negative example, I experienced a negative example, and then so I'm terrified of being that negative example, and I will fight or run from if I see anything that even remotely resembles that yeah. negative example. Man. That's a lot. That's a lot. Which is why we need discipleship, which is why we mm-hmm. need Jesus, which is why the healing, and this is why the world reacts with drag queen shows, because instead of addressing the issues, let's just go with it. Let's just let's just live in our feelings. And And, and that's, and there's a part of that, there's, and it's part of it's good. It's part the heart the heart behind it is like I want to nurture you, but as we know that single single parent homes aren't the best environment for children to grow up in. We need a father that disciplines and loves and corrects and and challenges uh, children to grow up and leave childish ways behind. Uh, and the whole time you need the effect of a nurturing mom and a and a father that encourages, exhorts, and corrects. And I think that's what. Uh, our culture is missing. We've sort of said, listen, we don't need any men around anymore. Men are toxic. We need more women, and we need to nurture people. But then the weird thing is, is that then women in that, I think there's two things happen. Women either just try to become men because they, they're they going to be the thing that's missing. Right. Um, or, or we just want to erase men, uh, maybe utilize their sperm to uh, keep the race going. And if we could, we could just procreate without men at all. And I think that's the struggle that the culture is facing overall. And if I could, you know, if I could speak into the culture, the thing that the church is offering you, you know, the sanity that's coming from heaven, we're ambassadors of heaven. We're saying, listen, I, I'm not going to sit, I don't want to get into, I, you probably won't see me protesting a library. Uh, and we were talking about like, how far do you go? But what I will be saying is like, I want to offer you something better than mm-hmm. sort of like just living in your feelings and your feelings are what rule you so that you will take drugs to make your body match your feelings, which is so weird to think about. Yeah. Like you don't want to be a prick about everything, <laughs> but you don't want to be enabling about everything. Yeah. That's good. You, you, if you're in support of everything, then... You're not really for anything. Right. This goes back to there's no backbone. Right. It, it's all about. It's whatever you want to Whatever do. you want to be, whatever you want to do. We're chasing happiness. Yeah. And happiness is so elusive. Okay. I feel like we've, I think we've nailed it for this episode. I really thank everyone who's joined us live online. So make sure you leave it. You can leave a comment in, in anywhere you're streaming. Uh, we would love to follow up with you there or go to pastorplek.com or text us at 737-231-0605. And we'd love to follow up with you. We have, we have a ton of uh, more episodes to get to because we have a lot of questions backlogged, uh, but we do want to get to all of them. So please um, engage uh, Pastor Plex podcast. In fact, if you're watching right now, would you mind sharing this uh, to let other people know how they can find out more about uh, really engage faith culture, engaging faith culture and everything in between. Thanks so much for watching. and. Uh, Have an awesome week of worship. (laughs) 